Okay, so so there's two sort of parts to this fundamental theorem of calculus. One tells us how to take um, a derivative of an area function. So we're kind of like differentiating a definite integral where the variables is one of the limits of, of, uh, of uh, integration. And we get back just the integrand function, just replace the t with x. Um, and the other version, which we'll focus on more today, is the what most people sort of like think of when they think of the fundamental theorem. It basically tells you how to evaluate a definite integral. And you do that by taking the, an antiderivative of the integrand and then evaluating it at the limits. All right? So everything we learned over those couple days on anti-differentiation now come into play here. All right? So for the first one, we want to evaluate the integral from negative 2 to negative 3 of the function x to the negative 3. So what we're going to do is we're just going to find an antiderivative of x to the negative 3 and then plug some things in. So recall that for there's sort of a power rule for antiderivatives, which says that the an, an antiderivative of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c if n does not equal 0. Or sorry, if n does not equal negative 1. All right, so one sort of notation for doing this um, is to basically write out the antiderivative in brackets and then put the limits of integration to one side. And it's sort of like telling you it's just an intermediate step. And then in the next step, we'll plug them in. All right, so using this rule, what would be an antiderivative of x to the negative 3? Good, x to the negative 2 divided by negative 2. So, or negative Okay, and then another way of writing this would be negative 1 over 2x squared Okay, and then we just sort of start plugging these values in, all right? And remember, you're subtracting. It's f of capital F of B minus capital F of A. All right, so negative 1 squared is just 1. Negative 2 squared is 4. Um, so the first term becomes negative 1 half. The second term, I'm subtracting a negative, so those cancel out. And I get 1 over 2 times 4, so 1 eighth. All right, negative one half could be written as negative four over eight. All right, barring any uh, arithmetic errors on my part. All right, any questions there? Nope. All right. So why don't y'all try the next one? And remember, the power rule does not work if the power is negative 1, which it is in this case, right? So why negative? OK, yeah. All right. So. So you, have to, so you won't use the power rule to take this antiderivative, so you'll have to think a bit about what's an antiderivative of like 1 over x.
that's that's technically correct. The uh, the antiderivative of one over x is the ln of the absolute value of x. among us is not a bro. On the syllabus. So the week 14 grade is 30% midterm one, 20% uh, module one, 20% module two, 15% uh, written homework, 15% my lab math homework. Okay, so an antiderivative for one over x is ln of x, right? So we get five ln of three minus five ln of one. Unless I'm tripping. Yes, but we're just integrating from, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, did you answer something before? Yeah, for one over x. Okay, so what is, what is ln of one? Good, so this is just five, the natural log of three. Okay, perfecto.
Yeah, we haven't really done like any, we haven't like really given them anything that would be like a sort of an indefinite or um, like a not well-defined integral, I guess, yet. So that is something that you would want to keep track of. If I was integrating this over zero, like from negative one to one, you, we would need to use some techniques that we haven't learned yet since the function itself isn't defined at zero. OK, so let's look at the next question. So we start off with an area function. So, so g of x is the area from 0 to x under the sine curve. Right? On the interval from 0 to 2 pi, let's sketch the function of sine. So sine starts at 0 goes up to 1, all the way down to negative 1, and then back to 0 in one period. OK. So the question is, when does g of x reach its maximum value? So g is not the sine function. g is the area under the sine curve. Good, at pi. From 0 to pi, the function itself is positive. So all the area is like counted as positive net area. Once I get past pi, the area becomes like we, we consider it a negative net area. So I start I start taking away from my area. All right. So uh, no no solicitations. All right. So um, <laughs> so what is the actual value there? It'd be the value from zero to pi sine theta d theta. All right, so what is an antiderivative of sine? Good, cosine. Or negative cosine. Mm -hmm. OK, so you just plug in pi and 0. So you get negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of 0. Cosine of pi is what? Negative 1. So I have a negative out front, so it becomes plus 1. These two negatives, minus minus cosine, give me positive. And cosine of 0 is just 1. Okay, so we get two. Amazing. It's true. This is very advanced counting. All right. So for the next part, it's asking what is g prime of x and what is g prime of pi over 2? All right, so why don't you all try this one? All right, so remember g of x is the integral from 0 to x sine theta d theta. So what is the derivative of g? On you, bro. So 
look at what what is the variable. So g is a function of what variable, and g prime should be a function of the same. Okay, so according to the first part of the fundamental theorem, what is the derivative of g? Digame. Good, sine of x. All right, thus, g prime of pi over 2 is sine of pi over 2, which evaluates to what? One, exactly. All right, the last part, um, what is g prime of x cubed? So here we're asking like, okay, so g prime of x cubed is kind of asking what is the derivative of g of x cubed, but this is just the chain rule. Um, yeah, I don't really like the way that's written, g prime of x cubed. It should be more, so kind of ignore this. That's true. Universal language. I'm not, I'm not too sure on that accent, but I went for it. All right. So the idea here is um, you're just using the chain rule, right? And there, another way of rephrasing this question, which would be like the, a more common way of writing it, would be what is like the derivative of the integral from zero to x cubed sine theta d theta. Okay, and it works out the same way as if it was just x, basically. You just have to remember to multiply by the derivative of x cubed at the end. Okay, so you basically plug in 
x cubed for sine rather than x. And then you just have to remember to multiply by the derivative of x cubed. Indeed. Couldn't say it better. Okay, so now we're going to start looking at a sort of uh, mean value theorem for integrals. Okay, so I kind of want to skip number three for now and go to number four, since we sort of just worked with sine of x. And I want you to try to answer what is, what is the average value of sine on the interval from zero to pi? Okay, so we found we found out from part, from what, what was that question two? So from question two, we know that the integral from zero to pi of sine theta d theta evaluates to two. All right, so I'm gonna break out into groups and I want you all to think about what, what, would, what does it mean to ask what is the average value on this interval? Right. Think about how you take how you find an average if you have discrete values. Right. Right. You like sum. You sum up the values and divide by um, the number of the number of values in your sum. So how would you do this in a continuous case?
Okay, so when we're talking about taking the average of a continuous function, we sort of use some, some kind of like analog to the discrete case. So actually, I'm going to go back to number three before explaining number four. Um, oh, those are, um, oh, I see, Gabriel. So those are uh, units that we were going to do before all this mess happened, and they've been sort of like cut from the syllabus. So they, you will not have them as homeworks. 13.1 and 13.2 are, are sections that we're not covering anymore. Mm -hmm. So in the discrete case, if I want to take, they were, they're like on the dot product. I don't know. They really have nothing to do with calculus. Um, yeah, vectors. Apparently, the engineering department wants us to cover it vectors. So we do in calculus. They're not that important. Not that important. No. <laughs> All right. So in the discrete case, how do we take an average? We just add things up and then divide by how many units we added up. So if this is like. So we, we, we add them up and then um, divide by the number of points. So you, you take 55 plus 43 plus 38 plus 30, 32 and divide by 4. And this would get you 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, in a continuous case, we're, it's like we're trying to do sort of the same thing. We're like trying to add up every value and divide by the number of values we add up. But there's, since it's continuous, there's infinitely many. So the continuous sort of analog is rather than taking a sum, you take an integral. So recall, we sort of define an integral. as a limit of sums. Okay, so if a function is continuous on a closed interval, then the average value is equal to that integral from A to B divided by the length of the interval. All right, so this is sort of the continuous analog to an average. All right, so if I want to find the average value of the function sine x on the interval from 0 to pi, how do I add up all the values? So I do that by integrating, essentially, right? So I integrate 0 to pi sine theta d theta to get 2, and then the average value will be this integral and it's like I'm sort of trying to divide by like quote unquote the number of values that I averaged over which we, we take to be the length of the interval so the interval goes from 0 to pi and I get 2 over pi is my answer
All right. So that's how that's that's how you average a continuous function. You integrate it over the interval and then divide by the length of the interval. Okay, so now, true or false? The integral from a to b of the derivative of f is equal to the value of f at b minus the value of f at a. Yes means true. Okay. So in a landslide, victory true wins. And indeed, that is the correct answer, right? Because f is an antiderivative of f prime. So this is really just a statement of the second part of the fundamental theorem. Okay, so if we know that a function f takes the value 250 at 10, and we know that the integral of its derivative from 10 to 20 is 25, how could we find f of 20? So in terms of f, like lowercase f, what does this integral evaluate to? It should be like an expression. Yeah, exactly. Good. Okay, so we know that this expression has to equal 25, and we know that f of 10 is 250. So then what is f of 20? Perfect, yep. Indeed, I did. Okay, so now the last problem. Um, so you can get like, you can sort of ask more complicated questions using the first uh, part of the fundamental theorem. So say I wanted to look at what is the derivative of the integral from x squared to x cubed of sine of t over t dt. All right, so now both, like normally, like the, the fundamental theorem says that if I take the integral from like a constant a to x of f of t dt, the derivative of that is just f of x, all right? And we've seen how to deal with like maybe if you take the integral from like one to x cubed, how you can deal with that, you sort of just use the chain rule. But what if, what if, both, the, um, what if both limits are functions of x and more complicated than x, how can we do that? So we can sort of use uh, the rules of integration uh, the rules of like, or some of the rules for definite integrals to split this up. So 
So I could basically take a constant, say 1, and split this integral up. I could integrate from x squared to 1 and then add the integral from 1 to x cubed. OK, so I've sort of split the integral from x squared to x cubed into two like smaller, or quote unquote, smaller integrals. All right, and now I can use what we've done before to evaluate this. So for one, I could flip just like one more step, I could flip uh, the limits of integration for the first integral. Okay, and then you can split up the derivative as well. So that is that you're taking the derivative of each of these terms separately. So All right, so now for each of these, you'll just plug in x squared or x cubed in for t, and then multiply by the derivative of either x squared or x cubed. So I'll plug in x squared, and I'll get negative sine of x squared over x squared times 2x plus sine of x cubed over x cubed times 3x squared. All right, so this is sine x cubed over x cubed. 3x squared minus sine x squared over x squared 2x. OK, and things would actually simplify here a bit, because um, x squared over x cubed would give you an x on the denominator, and 2x over x squared would give you an x on the denominator. Okay, so this would be like the most sort of simplified answer. All right, any questions on that? Nope. All right, so that'll be all for today. Um, I'll have office hours after this, and otherwise, I'll see most of y'all on Wednesday. Yep, peace.
Uh, that's the answer. The last thing I've written squared um, is sort of like the most simplified. So you might see something like that on my math lab. Mm -hmm. 